we do have a couple of things planned so let's officially start this so hi everyone before we officially kick this off i would like to do an acknowledgement of country we would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being held on the traditional lands of a variety of proud aboriginal tribes including the Ugambe people here where i'm based in queensland we pay our respects to indigenous elders past presents and emerging we recognize that sovereignty was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to AGS webinar on VC in digital games. My name is Jens. I'm a GS director of industry member relations. And in the role, I act as a linchpin between our developer members and our association to see how we can best support them in terms of research, advocacy, and other means. And this webinar is a good example of the latter. It dives further into some of the concepts we touched on in our recently released investment resource. I'm going to put a link to that um, in the chat later on. So if you're not aware of that, um, I'll put that in there later. As you know, finding funding is one of the biggest challenges when you start your studio or if you start working on a game for that matter. So there are many ways to find it's a studio or a game, all with their own advantages and challenges. And our resource aims to provide an overview of what types of funding are out there what type of projects they uh, they suit so today we're going to explore the concept of venture capital in a bit more detail to that end i'd like to welcome michael from makers fund scott from what and tima from alta makers fund is one of the world's largest vc uh, with a focus on games with investments ranging from seed to round b funding and what that is we're going to explore that uh, in um and then a little later on, Mod.io is a modding platform that celebrated 300 million downloads in January and recently managed to attract 26 million US dollars of Series A funding. And meanwhile, Alta is the company behind the successful virtual reality role-playing game, A Township Tale, which spent seven weeks at number one on the Oculus or Meta charts. And at the beginning of the year, Alta managed to bank 17.3 million from Makers Fund. So before I start with the questions, just some quick words regarding the format of this you know the drill but in case you don't if you haven't already done so please mute yourself i will ask our guests a range of questions and you will get an opportunity to ask some questions afterwards i will monitor these questions on zoom but also twitch and then relay them back to our guests and well that's pretty much it so with a view to that let's kick it off um let's start with something pretty basic michael what actually is venture capital funding when I mean, you hear it you, you know you hear VC, it but what exactly is it like let's start with the fundamentals here yeah sure so really i guess uh, if you take a step back if if you're thinking if someone is thinking hey uh, i'm about to start a company or a studio uh, to build uh, either a game or to build a platform of some sorts obviously the one of the first few th thoughts is hey how am i going to fund this and of course, many of us will be familiar with the publishing model. And that is often when you work with someone like, you know, EA or Ubi, and they will give you some money, they'll give you kind of milestones for your project. And over time, um, you know, you'll focus on the project, but they will in turn return for that capital, they will re request some kind of revenue share and sometimes licensing agreement or exclusive publishing rights um, in the long term. Now, what venture capital does instead is it focuses more on who are the team and who are the people behind that project and what is the company they're working for and instead um, of providing capital just for the project actually invest directly into the company and the reason why it is becoming increasingly popular of the funding method is really for a few reasons um one these days you know companies can work on multiple projects so you know Venture capital doesn't really care about what is the project or game you're working on, right? Let's say you're working on two games in parallel, you know, the venture capital funding because it goes to the company, it doesn't really matter which project you work on, A or B, or indeed if you work on A and later you have to pivot to B, that's also fine. Um, the second kind of reason why it's pop quite popular is also because you know, if, 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 the, the company, if the game doesn't do well, but eventually maybe the company will focus on another project and, and you know, some of those decisions in the, the resourcing decisions in the interim, um, publishers can kind of be a bit more biased towards only caring about their, you know, their project getting the resources and, and getting the attention. Um, but in fact, you know, if you're a holder in, in shares of the company and, and, and kind of a venture capital investor, you really only care about the long-term success of, of the company, right? And where it goes in the long-term. And that goes on to kind of the final reason why venture capital 
is kind of um, more prevalent in our sector these days. And that is because it's kind of a more of a long-term patient investor. So for example, when we invest, we typically are thinking you know, five to 10 years um, of relationship with a, with a founder. And um, you know, we, we don't really think too much about the short term, nor do we take any revenue share or profits from the company. Uh, we much more focus on, okay, you know, what's the direction of the studio? What's the first game? What's the second game? What's the direction? How, what is the long-term vision for that company or studio so that in seven years time, um, what really wants, what really does the founder want to do, right? Do they want to keep running the company um, perpetuity or do they want to consider, you know, an exit to a larger company or even you know, list on a, a public stock exchange? And really those are the kind of timeframes that, that venture capitalists normally think about when they invest. Yeah, thank you. So can you give us a bit of an insight into how exactly it works? Like, you know, I mentioned seed funding before, I mentioned series A, series B. What exactly are those concepts and, and how do they work? And when do they kick in? Yeah, so I guess once the founder has decided, hey, I want to raise venture capital funding, um, all of these phrases around series seed, A, B, C, really what they denote are the stage of the company or, or the game or whatever is being worked on, right? So for example, uh, a series C company would be likely someone who's maybe just left their company or they've worked on a very small prototype that maybe hasn't got the full team together. And therefore the amount of money needed is a lot less, but also comparatively the, um, the, the risk and the um, stage of the product is a lot earlier. And so there are certain funds in the world and They'll say, hey, we focus on series seed, which means they normally invest something between, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 all the way up to maybe $3 million, right, uh, USD. And so really that's what series seed means. And then you kind of, then as you develop the game, you kind of progress towards what we call series A. And series A is, it could be two things, but, it, you know, really it could mean, hey, here's our, you know, uh, closed beta. Uh, we don't really have much of a user base to show metrics on, but, you know, this is, um, this is a game that we're working on and, and we believe they have potential and grow. Um, and then sometimes there are also series A companies where they've actually launched the game um, and therefore you can see that it has a lot of momentum, but maybe some money is needed to, to, to further market or grow the potential of, of that game. Um, and then finally, we have kind of series B and, and C onwards, which are kind of more merged together. But that's when, hey, look, I've got something successful and it's very clear if I pump more money in, that you know, either I'm going to continue running that game and, and running the live ops more effectively, or it could indeed mean saying, hey, I'm going to grow it even further, right? I'm running my mobile studio. I'm currently spending $100,000 a day. I spend a million dollars a day. And I believe I can grow this company, like this, the revenue of this game by you know, 100 times, right? And so really that's the difference in scale. And if you, you know, for example, have someone like, um, um, you know, like Tima, uh, I think the company go clearly is in kind of like a that, 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 that kind of gap between Series A and B, where they've lost something. Obviously, it's hugely successful, and the capital really is to help them or um, you know, extend that success even further, right? Either with an existing title, a new title, but also to support the company. Because obviously, as you do this as well, um, a lot of hiring is required. You want to bring really the best people. You've proven yourself. You know, when the people you want to hire now are, are not as um, concerned for the risks of a project because you can just point simply as a unit sale. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, Tima is hiring. Um, you already, uh, you, you, um, you know, you, you mentioned return on, on um, investment, you know, a mobile company growing their return by 100%. So, so what are some of the expectations that you have of a studio that, that you invest in? You also alluded to the long time frame you work with the studio. So, you know, I mean, it was, I was talking to someone the other day who's like, hey, I, I have a great game, a great brand, a great product. Why do these other people get millions of dollars and not me? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so, okay, I, I can kind of speak to what we focus on a little bit and maybe elaborate on maybe where that might also go for others. I think primarily what we care about for studios um, is actually people who are innovating on either, you know, gameplay innovations or genres and people who are really doing it with a global scale in mind, right? So I, I think um, th th there's kind of like a dichotomy of developers currently, I would say. There is like kind of the 
the smaller teams who are maybe, you know, sometimes as small as two people or the up to maybe five people teams. And I would say that ranges everything from a classical indie, but also to like triple I. And I think that these developers are typically um, geared up really well to, 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 to focus on, you know, premium game company, a pre premium business model, build certain successes and focus on building, um, you know, sequels to that and building a kind of franchise over time. Um, but maybe you know, a lot of that is driven more by, um, you know, a, a, a strong desire uh, to, to work on with a small team. I would say that the other kind of um, group of developers, they probably, they, they want to build something maybe a bit larger in scale, right? So if you think about a lot of the well-known successes um, that we always refer to in the gaming industry, right? Um, uh, especially a lot of the um, more recent exits, these are the companies that have achieved a certain amount of scale and also potential. And I, I think, you know, what for us, what's, what's the same between the two is that you can find people who are innovating on gameplay um, and they may both be targeting a global market, but the difference is also what happens after that success, right? And we really, um, makers, um, and me personally, I get excited by meeting people who have like a long-term vision for a certain maybe genre. They want to be like the, you know, the leader in a certain gameplay type. And I think um, that's really what, what gets me excited. And, and for example, when we do back studios, we can see that there's a, something more than just a single title, right? There may be um, a, a desire to slightly expand the team um, over time to help them be able to do more things, right? And, and a great example is um, um, you know, the, the, the studio behind Cuphead, I think, and even the Among Us team, right? They did one of the most fantastic commercial hits of 2021. Um, well, uh, among us type team did, but the, I think as a team, they really wanted to keep that culture small, um, you know, have the founders involved in everything and, and not grow too much and keep their own pace. And whilst there's nothing wrong with that, that also is, I would say less likely to attract venture capital investment because I guess whilst venture capitalists don't mind about the time frame, you know, five to 10 years, they also want to see pathways to kind of a, a more kind of stable business that's generating revenues that can grow and ultimately uh, in the same way that a publisher wants rev share so they can exit the end of a project a venture capitalist ultimately wants one day in the long run to either you know, exit their shares in the company through you know, an acquisition or public listing um, or some other means so really that's what drives the decision making behind some of these uh, expect, like expect, uh, expectations and differences in um, VC studios. And you know, finally, um, you know, that fortunately or unfortunately, um, there are a lot of venture capitalist investors who for some reason, um, they like to chase hype a bit. And uh, you know, as we all know, there's some hype going around the industry. Um, but you know, I, I think the, the the real difference is some people are maybe better at explaining an exciting narrative and some others are not. And, and that can also differentiate whether a studio gets funded or not. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for, for that overview. So I, I guess one of the more important points to, to um, focus on is, is that a VC ultimately is, is looking for an exit. With, with you know a fairly high return on the initial investment is, is that is that a correct summary yeah I think you know whilst for example at the start we don't really think too much about it um, because sometimes we can invest at the beginning of like a seven eight year journey mm -hmm. um, you know ultimately yes it's correct it, it is important to note that any investor right um, into a company typically would and at some point in time want to be discussing a, a, an exit right yeah, and fair enough too. Um, you alluded already to some of those things, but what can you bring to the table to support a studio other than money? Like, you know, do, for example, have any networks that help the company grow or, you know, what, what else is there? What, what are some other factors as to why a studio should consider VC? Yeah, and I think this one really comes down to the individual. Um, so for example, myself, uh, I've been really fortunate to spend a lot of time with different you know, creative directors, product leads of different games. So I tend to find, I spend most of my time talking about product. Um, you know, it could be product features, brainstorming, it could be what's, what's the latest um, feature innovation that's really changing the game in China or 
um, you know, what are some of the leading gameplay mechanics that some of the you know triple A's or other startups are really focusing on? Um, is it you know co-op PVE, PC multiplayer, or maybe you know people are really exploring um, you know, new monetization methods with Web three, um, or even just strategically, right? Uh, how do different players and who's work who's really making cross platform um, work well, right? Or is it just simply a pipe dream that everyone keeps talking about but no one executes on? So I spend a lot of my time talking about that, and secondarily, uh, I think strategically that's another area where a lot of um, founders lean on us a little bit. Uh, you know, we're fortunate to have people in most of the major gaming hubs in the world. So we've got someone in you know, the U.S., uh, in Europe, in China, Japan. Um, in Asia, and really that helps us just talk to the different leaders and the AAAs to play the local game, see what's working, see what isn't, and hopefully share back some of that insight to the founders we work with. And 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 actually, interestingly, I think that's something that um, founders and or people in Australia um, found particularly helpful. So I guess sometimes it's really easy just to get a bit of tunnel vision um, with the product or, or you know, industry that one one's in. Yeah, excellent. Well, look, thank you very much. Let's explore um, VC funding in a bit more detail, uh, looking at some local examples, namely um, Scott and Tima. And give them finally an opportunity to say something as well. Um, so Scott, Tima, both of you um, managed to attract um, VC capital for your company. Um, how did it help you? What did it do for, for, for your company? Tima, let's start with you. Uh, I think for us, it's like uh, really allowed you to think like long term, right? Because obviously we had like successful game and we had like uh, like you know good revenue, right? But it's really like even like after successful game, uh, you still your options are very limited, right? And also in terms of hiring, like especially if you're looking for like high level talent, right? Like you know obviously like when you like in this like you know it's Microsoft Tunnel Vision, you did successful game and you're like oh I'm awesome, but the fact is there is like successful game every day on like Steam Store. Right, like every day there is some kind of success around the world. So, like having venture funding is basically like de-risks people joining your company. So you can actually approach like you know, you know, very talented people which you never would ever approach, and they bring a lot of long-term uh, value to, to the company, to the game, to the to the project, which is you know, which normally you, even with like successful kind of independent studio you wouldn't even you know dream of. And that's for us is like by far like the biggest thing. It's just kind of going to this next level and having a long-term vision of what, what we want to build. Yeah, thank you. And again, Tima's hiring. By the way, Tima's also in Las Vegas. So Michael, not quite sure what he's <laughs> doing there with, with your funding. But uh, anyway, <laughs> don't worry, everyone, he's at dice. Um, Scott, <laughs> same question to you. Um, what did venture capital do, do for your company? How did, how did it manage to, to support you and your growth? Yeah, I wish I was in uh, Vegas, but um, yeah, slightly different journey to to Tima in that um, we're we're innovating in I guess probably an unproven and uh, area within gaming that's got we believe a ton of potential, and that's mods and UGC and really helping studios build community um, content uh, and a business models around that. Um, and when we started this project in two thousand and seventeen. Uh, Roblox and some of the stories that we saw last year and sort of that whole focus on the creator economy and everything. Like we actually believed that back then, um, but not many people did. Uh, it was sort of a very unproven area where there'd been a little bit of experimentation from Valve, Skyrim and others that probably hadn't quite gone uh, the way that they had hoped. Uh, but we certainly felt given trends in the industry, this is going to be an area that's going to be really big and exciting moving forward because studios are very um, tied to content production and business models increasingly are tied to what do you do with the player post-release of your game and how do you uh, create value for them that then creates value for you because for, for you as a business and we felt the morning and UGC is going to be a really big benefactor and player in that sort of shift um, in mindset and thinking for consumers and studios so with that in mind um, we didn't have a revenue stream and um, we were entirely bootstrapping the business. As a bootstrap biz business, very limited is that in our scope. Like we had a team of three, um, couldn't really take risks. We had to build this company organically. And what we felt and what we saw is the market was moving really fast around us. Uh, we felt there's an opportunity here to really capture market share and to establish Modrio as a brand that people respect and turn to and trust as the UGC sort of 
thought leaders. Um, and to do that, we need to really scale up and get much more aggressive in how we pursue this opportunity. Uh, and so VC venture capital made a lot of sense for us in that, again, same to what Timo and Michael said, it, it allowed us to take that 10 year roadmap and vision that we've had from day one um, and then start applying it. And we've had a very sort of traditional process where we first year was bootstrapping. We got a bit of validation Then we did our seed round. Um, we raised a small amount of capital. We then went on to our, we then showed with that seed capital, we built a, you know, a product, got our first few partners on board, showed good growth, um, moved on to, you know, like our, well, actually we did a pre-seed, like an angels round and a seed round then a series A. So each, each step we've, we've grown and grown and we've continued to deploy our VC capital, continue to scale, scale the business. Um, and you know, open up this opportunity. So for us, it allowed us to really think and deploy you know, in a manner that our business requires to really achieve success. Great, so very similar story there. This really enables you to realize your vision and take your company to the next level. Um, so Scott and Tima, um, looking at the investments that, that you've received, what made your company attractive to venture capital, you think? Scott, let's, let's uh, continue with you. You've got a, I suppose story is very important. The story that you believe in, um, because it's like venture capital uh, like get a lot of offers, I imagine. Also, I've not been on that side of the fence. I've certainly helped um, advise and talk to another, a number of other companies. And so they get a lot of pitches um, and for them, you really have to probably put their hat on. And whilst they're not focused on the short term, like I think that short term thinking is not their mandate, but they want to invest in things that they believe in and can see uh, a long term outcome and success, that capital will help you realize. So um, uh, I suppose when I was pitching VCs, for me, like I was, I was really pitch, pitching from a position of passion, and that is create a you know, have always enabled incredible things through the gaming industry, whether it's Counter-Strike, Dota, and all this innovation. Studios have always really had that at arm's length. They've had no way to really tap into that. Um, meanwhile, business models have trended towards gas and free-to-play, and now we've got Games Pass and subscription services that are further pushing um, studios to think of not that initial transaction and then just shipping game, game, game with an you know, initial premium sort of purchase attached to it, but to actually... How do they generate success through the plays that they have playing their game on a daily basis? And um, when we looked at that and the shifts in the models, we're like, well, UGC and you know, an economy and some sort of business model attached to it solves a lot of these problems. It gives studios that content that then drives engagement in their player base, works perfectly with subscription services. That economy can then reach you know, real scale that they couldn't hope to achieve with a, you know, a content production team or compete head on with, say, the epics of the world that have hundreds of people making emotes and, and skins on a daily basis. Um, and so <clears throat> we just told VCs this story and we, we basically, you know, we've refined it over the years um, as we've learned more. But each step along the way, we've sort of said, look, you know, UGC right now accounts for probably one in 50, if not one in $100 spent in the gaming industry. We think over time that's going to become one in $5 spent in the gaming industry for that to happen, systems like us have to basically make this product as a service that makes it easy for studios so they don't have to worry about moderation, safety, curation, discovery, commercialization, contracts with creators, paying creators. Like we just take all that complexity off their plate. And uh, I think when we you know, told venture capitalists that story, they believe it's like they think that the shift is coming. Uh, and in many ways, we'll probably assisted when Roblox actually validated what we've been talking about for three plus years in that they showed the scale that you can achieve where they went from a, a business that primarily made premium content in 2016 and turning on their DevEx, their developer exchange. Uh, and we all know that they've grown you know, 100, 200% year on year and they you know, IPO'd at a tens of billion dollar juggernaut. Like we think that story is repeatable. We're building the platform to help enable that. Like, so that just added fuel to the fire for us and, um, I, I guess you know, builds further confidence with VCs and we just got to show them the way that people and the business and the, they can deliver it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we'd love to see it. Um, Tima, what about you? What, what do you think made, made your company attractive to venture capital investments? 
uh, I think like Scott can mention it, that uh, I think it's important for founder like to understand the trends in the industry, especially gaming industry, right? And where the growth comes from, right? And it's obviously for Scott is the UGC or where it's fast is uh, like a VR metaverse, right? And uh, kind of VR initially, you know, when we started in uh, you know 2016, you know, our initial vision was to be like, you know, open worlds using a procedural generation. So kind of solving the problem of content through you know, algorithms versus, you know, user generated content. Um, and, uh, you know, that was our original vision, but, you know, like at the time it was really, you know, hyped and we managed to kind of do like a seed round, pre-seed round, like a very small round. Uh, but then uh, it, it, like the industry didn't deliver, the industry like in 2016, 2017 didn't deliver. So like a kind of, you could say tell any story you wanted at that time in terms of where, where VR is going and how it's going to be, you wouldn't be able to raise a dollar, right? So it's like I think it's a combination of you know excellent like storytelling and actually you know being in the place where market is going at the right time, right? And for us, we like we're extremely like fortunate uh, that obviously you know we you know after that period we self funded uh, the company. And uh, and then Facebook Meta approached us and you know asked us to put money into us to bring the game to uh, Quest, and then we were at the point where like VR adoption like you know spiked after Quest two coming out and new content coming to the device, so it's kind of right place, right time, and we kind of you know our initial vision merit where VR market was. And it became like for investors, it became very like valuable. It's like, okay, if you can solve this problem of, you know, build, building this massive world uh, in VR using this technology um, for your IP or different IPs, it can be like a huge company down, down the road, right? And I think that's, uh, that's kind of what did it for us. Uh, but I would say it's um, like from founders, but like uh, Scott obviously has like more, uh, you know, more experience in working with other founders. Uh, but I would be really careful, like, uh, you know, kind of having like a ability to evaluate the market, like functions have very limited ability, because sometimes, you know, we might think that, for example, like uh, crypto and uh, web free is big right now, right? But like, it's we're kind of hearing it from the news, but actually the wave might be gone, right? So it's really important for founders to like, to talk to VCs early and actually find out like where the market is going, what people are excited about, first kind of make assumptions uh, or like hear from like, hey, that's what's hot. Or, or like somebody raised something and then just assume that's the case. And I think it's really important like to be like very well informed and actually talk to the people who see deals on uh, like either advisors or VCs who see deals like on daily basis, because otherwise you can just make the wrong assumptions and build something which is not fundable from the get-go. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And maybe, um, maybe it's good for me just to chime in here because I think, so to, to that point, like a, maybe a good piece of advice is to really think about if you're looking at raising funding, what's the, what's the trend, as Tima said, like what is changing in the industry or what's the opportunity that gets you excited and also that should get whoever is um, you know, looking to ask for funding from um, why should they be excited, right? And so, for example, in, in the case of Scott's and Mondo IO, uh, it's the belief that the UGC business model can become one of the main business models for gaming studios in the future, right? So instead of just leaning on the crutch of assuming free-to-play or assuming premium plus cosmetics, is there a long-term, more sustainable business model proven by Roblox that can really change how all game studios think about monetization going forward, right? And obviously, if that happens, but uh, will be the, the, the only and the best company really to work with for that. And then in the case of someone like Tima, um, you know, to his credit, I think he really survived the, the quote unquote like VR winter. Uh, but like thereafter was really, you know, amazing because I think what we've seen in literally the last 12 months is um, the emergence and the proof that actually people who play on you know, VR and, and even you know, play on PC and VR worlds are actually much more engaged and Kind of retain retentive and more um, monetizable in the long run um, in, in these kind of worlds, and they are more sticky, right? I've seen experiences like VR chat, and so it really is possible to do that. And I think that's really what investors and like ourselves are excited by is what happens if you know, um, you know Township Tail goes beyond what it is to get today to an even more longer term engaging experience, or even if you know Alter becomes 
you know, the best studio in the world to focus on building VR experiences um, going forward, right? And so I think those occur to examples. And if I was starting a studio, I think the first thing I think about is why is what I, why is what I'm building exciting, right? Maybe the thesis could be, hey, I really believe that there is um, you know, undertapped opportunity in first person shooter co-op games uh, with a, I don't know, UGC business model. And, uh, and then you know, all you need to do then is just you need to explain why is it growing or why is it an opportunity? Um, how big is that market? And, and therefore, why is it exciting for anyone who's looking to invest or, or spend time or money in, in that sector, in that genre? Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. I mean, Tina, speaking of being at the right place at the right time and, and discussion about trends, do you think that the discussion around the metaverse um, also helped facilitate the, the investment? Uh, not at the time. At the time, we didn't really uh, uh, kind of tell story through metaverse uh, eyes. So no, no, we didn't at the time. Okay, I had to put it out there. <laughs> no, no, I'm uh, just being straightforward. Yeah. No, like, no, no, uh, no, no, fair enough. Um, yeah. That's just validating Tima's vision, right? Like Tima was probably, I imagine, thinking about this, and that's probably what the pitch was that he took into investors before it became a trend. Like, uh, I mean. Mm -hmm. We were talking about UDC economies being multi-billion dollar businesses a long time before Roblox was even remotely on the tip of people's tongues. VC investors, uh, I don't want to do Michael's job here. Uh, I think like, they, like anything, right, they're betting pretty early on companies that are largely unproven. And they know that a percentage of their portfolio, unfortunately, is not going to make it because you know, each one of those ideas is pretty radical in and of itself. So they need to see a path and VC economics, where it's like that, that dollar they put in over a 10-year period can be returned um, 10 times to make up for the, you know, the, the misses or that, they, that they had along the way. So you don't necessarily have to be focusing on something that's like trending right now, like Metaverse mm -hmm. or Web3. You, like, ideally, like you see that that's coming. You then create the story, the narrative, the, the numbers, the deck, whatever it is that helps VC see that story and see what you're talking about. Because I, you know, I think that's at least what made us appealing. We were like, this isn't happening today, but we think it will. And here's why we're going to change that. Um, and, and it does help when the trends start working in your favor. But uh, don't rely on them. Um, like you should be thinking of them. Yeah, fair enough. You got to get in at the right point of the hype cycle. Um, both um, Scott, Tina, and, and Michael touched upon some of these things already, but um, let's revisit the, the question. Um, what advice would you have com for companies considering VC investment? Is there anything that, that you haven't mentioned yet? Is there anything you'd like to put out there where it's, you know, if you are considering VC investments, this is what you should be doing. You know, you mentioned the storytelling in your pitch, the vision you've had. Was, was there anything else that you think will make a company attractive to VC funding? And how should they position themselves? Maybe Michael, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, no, I have um, I have one I, I think that I think that often gets overlooked, which is I think it's really important to talk about yourself and the team and why you're doing what you're doing. You know, because uh, it's kind of a it, it's a long endeavor, right? The kind of the time the time periods we were talking about. I mean, I, unfortunately, I had to be two people who really stuck out through thick and thin and been are where they are because of real passion and belief in what they're doing or excitement. And so I think that really expect explaining and articulating why is it that you're building this? You know, what, what happened in the past that led you to where you are today to be so excited to be about this opportunity? And I always find those kind of uh, stories really important to understanding someone's um, drivers and motivations, right? Because I guess the the, the really what I, I would really care about as a venture investor. And you know, when we think about working with someone, it, it really is for multiple years, right? It's um, you know, five, six, seven years. And so when you're seeing, seeing someone working with someone, you really want to ideally understand why they're doing what they're doing. And, and, and it goes both ways, right? Like, I mean, um, whoever is receiving the money, they should really think about who is this person that is talking to me and can I see myself working with them in, you know, in, in the long run? Because it's almost like getting an employee 
Uh, but you know, it, so you really want to think about: Can you get on with this person? Do you like? Do you value the input of this person? Um, and so I would not. I, I would look at that process both ways, right? There isn't any money is the same, and uh, you know, a lot of people on 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 this call, um, I think Tima and Scott especially, had many choices, and they kind of had to think about why they choose you to work with, and that's often underlooked, right? Until too late. Yeah, thank you. Um, Scott Tima, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective? I think uh, just to add from a slightly different angle too, from the founder's perspective, um, it's really important to get your ducks in a row um, and be organized uh, before you start pitching. Because the minute that you've pitched the, the first VC, the clock start essentially started ticking. And if you're still pitching three to six months down the road, people are going to naturally be like, why hasn't someone picked up on this deal? Um, it's just like, you know, if you're selling your house, if your house has been on the market for six months, people will be like, well, the price must be too high. Something's wrong with it. So as much as you can, you, the, the point at which you start pitching, you're either starting because you've already got a deal, someone's already come, come to you and offered you a deal, or you, you're quite organized. Like, you know who you're going to reach, you know what, kind of what you want, you've got your deck, and everything. And the best way to solve that for someone who maybe is doing their seed round and has never fundraised before, try to find a founder, like reach out to Tim or myself or anyone who's been through the journey that you uh, can approach, respect or whatever. Like, I, I mean, I've got a great advisor behind the scenes who's had previously raised $15 million in, in his venture. And, and um, you know, like he introduced me to tons of venture capitalists and uh, you know, opened a lot of doors, re reviewed my deck when the term sheet came in, reviewed that. Like, so it was somewhat of a, I didn't actually plan it this way. I only realized after the fact, but I, I kind of was pretty lucky that I had someone coaching me behind the scenes who was like, hey, you got to get that next conversation going. You got to get the first term sheet in. The minute you've got the first term sheet in and you like it, that's when you can then, you know, go to all the other VCs that you're talking to and say, hey, you, this is, you've got to now make a decision. I've got a term sheet that I like and I'm going to accept you got to get off the fence and decide, are you in my camp? Do you like what we're doing or are you not? Um, and so you can't just sort of haphazardly start it. It won't, it won't go well unless you're, you're a hot company. If, if you're a hot company, um, like, you know, chances are someone's already pinged you about it and you kind of know you are, and you know, then maybe you have a little bit more luxury of time. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Tima, what, what are you? Uh, yeah, I think what Scott says is so important, like just getting educated early as possible and some people are like like and especially in australia where like if we look at the ecosystems like silicon valley right like people kind of naturally know how a startup operate because it's kind of in their like blood right like either they know somebody who worked at a startup either they worked at a startup right so it's like yeah, like they know the terms they know investors so they know at least how the ecosystem like works whereas i think for australia is like getting this education and like talking to founders or like talking to angels well i mean depending on where they are but like getting good advisors is like really 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 critical uh, because like you can really like mess up and i did it like i messed up tons of time like because i was fundraising like six years and, like tons of times you come in like either i'm not completely prepared either you don't know what you're doing you're not raising in the like in the right location on the right documents and, like you know it's just a lot of details which goes into the fundraise which people don't know about right and it's like googling it and then just it's not enough like you know you really need to get advisors get people to help you and just get educated and take it like really really seriously uh because like as michael said like this relationship because like me and michael we met first time like in 2018 right or something like 2019 right like way before he made first investment uh, investment into alta Right, so it's like the relationship you're going to build of your even. Oh, I lost Tima. It's going to last you like probably. Long. Sorry, we just oh, you dropped out for a second. You could. Yeah, so it's like it's very close. Like everybody knows each other. So like as soon as you like the door opens and you start pitching, as a founder you become part of it, and it's really important to realize that. Uh, you know, you have to enter this door in the right way. You know, if you enter it in the wrong way, you can waste like years of your life uh, pitching and nothing going to come out of it. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I guess just listening to you and what Scott was saying about, you know, bringing all the ducks in a row, when's actually a good point to consider 
VC funding? Like, you know, do, I mean, both of you, uh, your companies already had very positive traction in the market. Um, but, you know, if there's someone who's like, well, you know, we're building, we are building the next big thing here, but we, we only have a prototype, but we have an experienced team or we don't. Like, when would you recommend looking into that? When's, like, when is, when's too early? Maybe, Michael, we can start with you. Uh, when is too early? Gosh, okay. Um, I, I think it really depends. Uh, these days, I, I've i seen more people benefit from having just a casual chat um, first and not necessarily pitch anything. So don't go... Like, I've had a lot, quite a lot of meetings recently where um i talk to someone they, they say very explicitly hey you know we're not really raising at the moment um but this is kind of what we're doing and don't necessarily share a lot of things i i've i've, I've seen this approach be beneficial for some certain people in a different um categories particularly if they're making a studio and things tend to be you know it takes time to develop a game right so um yeah, these kind of situations i think that's where I found it, it's okay to chat and, and have that. Um, but typically I would say, you know, when is too early would be either, maybe there isn't really a solid plan um, or there isn't a clear opportunity that they can articulate, right? So a few of the topics touched on today, right? Do you have a very clear understanding of where the opportunity is and why you're going after it, right? So. Um, I have met some founders whereby they say, hey, I, I want to start a game studio and I know it's going to be an MMORPG. I say, okay, sure. But do you know what are the, some of the gameplay mechanics? Like what's the setting? Um, what are some of the key um, kind of uh, gameplay features that you want to use to differentiate? It's a pretty crowded MMORPG market. But ah, we're still thinking about it. Okay, and, and that's okay. Um, and I've met founders and, and, and those people, normally they'll, the good people will say, hey, look, we're just thinking. So please don't think I'm raising anything. And that's fine. Those conversations are fine. But what, what wouldn't work is if that person would then say, but I'm looking to raise you know, $5 million. Don't really know what I'm doing, but here's my team. Um, I would say that kind of approach is very difficult. And I would advise most people not to do it. The only really times that I've seen people raise money with that kind of approach is if they're already a well-known figure, right? Like, so for example, I know someone like Ben Brode, uh, when he left Hearthstone, um, he, he basically didn't have much of a plan, right? Um, you know, Leslie Benzi of, of, of Rockstar also. But you know, besides this kind of um, category of person, probably you need a plan, uh, at least to articulate one. Um, and, and yeah, I'll say that's the only time it's really too early. These days, it, you know, it doesn't really matter right, uh, as much thereafter. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Scott Tima, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective? Yeah, I, I don't really think there's a too early if you're organized and you've got the right story, uh, the right team. You've probably, you've probably got to like tick two or three boxes. Like I don't quite know what VCs look for, but if you look in the market, what happens, you'll see stories of like Justin Khan recently just launched Fractal and he had funding in the first month because he, you know, he's the founder of Twitch. So he attracted funding because he's done it before. You see all of these people that have splintered out from Blizzard, Riot and large studios recently and then raising 30, $40 million for this year because they're kind of seen as the RTS, RPG, MMO type experts. So you, you can raise purely off team and concept with, with actual no product or production having started, as long as the story, the people and, and whatever else that you've got, you can back it up and, uh, with what you're saying um, and what you're pitching. So I, I don't think there's necessarily a too early. Um, I mean, we raised in 2019 was our first like pre-seed sort of angel round and we had no really traction or product or validation in the market at that stage. But what we did have is I, I founded ModDB uh, 10, you know, 15 years prior. So I said, look, you know, we're the domain experts. We've got a lot of experience in this space. Here's why we believe it. You know, we didn't really have a team. We had three people total um, and it was pretty tough. But the beautiful thing is like we raised from Play Ventures. They built a, a really strong brand, the sort of partners at that VC firm. They had introduced us to more VCs and it made our next round easier. And we also showed good progress. So 
there isn't necessarily a too early. It's about just making sure that the the narrative is good because um, you'll never raise whether it's early or late if the narrative isn't good. Yeah, uh, I would say it's like, uh, like I would even say that like even doing kind of initial conversations prior to even forming the companies, uh, like uh, as Michael said, like, you know, even, you know, obviously like if somebody building a product, but just having kind of initial, you know, thought about how to approach it and talking to people. And then like, and sometimes it will, especially nowadays where like the angel scene is so massive, like, you know, there's like, even in Australia right now, there's like hundreds of angels, right? And especially in gaming space, which is so hot, like sometimes you just, you know, like I have calls with people and they like for 20 minutes to talk about like the, whatever the idea is. And I'm like, hey, if you, you know, if you're starting the company, I'll be, I'm happy to put like money down. You know, and it just happens like in you know 15 20 minutes conversation it's all what is needed to kind of you know and they're not even asking right and just say like, if i like enough idea if i think it's like you know the trend i'll uh, like you know i'll commit pretty early you know my, myself so yeah i wouldn't say there is like you know as soon as you have any kind of idea uh, but obviously the don't talk to like mainstream VCs. Don't go to talk to Michael. It's like, hey, I'm thinking about like cats MMO. He might invest straight away. It's like, hey, Jim, <laughs> I'll put money into that. <laughs> but it's like, uh, uh, but it's like talking to angels, to like people, because a lot of people can give you money, right? Like not only VCs, like there's a huge like angel ecosystem, which can uh, like, you can start like, you know, even working somewhere. You can be like, hey, what do you think about this idea? And then you can, you can go from there. But yeah, like as soon as you approach like serious angels and serious as uh, Scott said, like yeah, your process has to be like, you know, on lockdown and you have to have a strategy to go into that and be very precise. But you don't need product, you don't need anything. You just really need to like either, you know, you will know what will you need, like depending on who you are. Like obviously if you're just a guy out of uni, right? You'll have very different experience fundraising than like, uh, you know, I don't know, like if John Carm, like you know, if Karma wants to do uh, another game company, I think he can just you know do a tweet, and then tomorrow he's going to have like fifty million in his bank account and he's ready to go, right? So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, we have about um, twelve minutes left for questions. So, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat here on Zoom or on Twitch, and I'll relay them back to our guests. So here's the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, we do have a question here on Twitch. I'm curious how confidentiality works when it comes to VC pitching. Well, um, Michael, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, no, that's actually a good question. So uh, a few things. I think firstly, as a VC, um, my job is obviously, part of my job is to meet lots of founders, work on different projects. And so I probably personally see uh, gosh, at least 500 different pitches a year um, and collectively, you know, as a team, maybe 2,000, 3,000. So, you know, there, there really isn't a lot of time for us to um, kind of share very deep confidential information with one company or another. Um, and so I, I think sometimes there can be a bit of a trepidation around sharing information um, or, or, you know, very out of metrics, for example, um, game performance metrics, and VCs. Uh, what I would, what I typically do is we don't, we don't normally ask for anything too um, confidential or anything in like initial meetings. And when we do get really interested, that's when we do uh, request it. And I think that's where you know it, it's also kind of somewhat in our interest not to do anything that might kind of sully our reputation, because ultimately, uh, you know, the reputation and and the the kind of brand that we that I represent and you know, that making sure that we actually are helpful, not destructive to industry is what we really care about. So yeah, I, I, I've encountered quite a few situations where maybe people are a bit worried about sharing, even game pitches, right? I've had it where people say, hey, look, in the publisher world, I would sign some kind of confidentiality agreement before I even pitch my game idea. And yeah, I, I think yeah, the ultimate response to that really is, is that we're in the business of investing into studios rather than making our own. And yeah, we've got over 90 companies that we have invested in around the world. So yeah, it's just not something that we're, it's in our interest to really break um, any you know, agreements or even um, share any confidential information. 
cool. Thank you very much. We do have another question here on Twitch um, from someone saying, hey, I'm not quite sure what a seed round is. What's required? How do they work? Michael, you talked about this previously. Would you mind talking about it again? A seed round. How does it work? What is it? Oh, well, maybe a good person to put in here is uh, uh, um, maybe Tima, because you, you raised a, a seed round or pre-seed round before even like before anything, right? Maybe you can kind of share what the company will look like back then. Yeah, so it's like, uh, as Michael said before, there's a lot of names to different rounds, like, and it's a little bit confusing. Um, like to make it easier, like, uh, like seed round is basically like kind of traditionally is something that, you know, like the way I think about it, obviously, is that you can raise in two ways, right? You can raise on sales or you can raise like on uh, selling your equity. And I'm not going to go into details what it is, but basically like early on seed round is something where you can kind of raise as you go. I know it's a little bit confusing it's like, like, without going into the detail, but uh, like normally like seed rounds is where you're going to have a lot of investors. Like our initial seed round, we had like 25 or like 21 initial investors, including like friends, friends and family, uh, some VCs, some accelerators. So it's basically who can't write like a huge check and wants to participate uh, and kind of that's what happens during seed round. Uh, where confusing part comes from is that uh, like sometimes you hear like, hey, this company raised a huge seed round, but that's a little bit different. It basically means it's like the first round they did. And if it's like, if they have a good traction then it can be like really huge. But in my mind, seed round is something which is like really tiny and where like uh, people write small checks and then, you know, and then gives you enough money to kind of start the company and start like doing prototypes, et cetera. Yeah, and I'll just elaborate. It's actually is seed round is also based on the stage of the company. So yeah, as Tim was saying, if you haven't really built much yet or what you've built is still quite embryonic, maybe it's just a prototype. It could be anything from, uh, I'm leaving my company and I want to hire, you know, I want to co-found a company with Scott, Timur and Jens. Uh, I would, you know, we know we're going to do this as a plan, but I don't have anything to show for it, right? It could be as early as that and as late as here's something we spent the last six, seven months building. It's very rough. It's like a very rough prototype, but it's used to demonstrate what the gameplay feel might look like. That essentially is a seed round. And normally the quantum is anything from, you know, a couple hundred K um, all the way up to a couple million. Uh, but the goal of that is to help kickstart a team. It's normally like the first funding anyone ever gets. You know, some people may even um, have built, you know, something that's about to launch because they've self-funded everything up to date, right? That also could, could be a seed round. Uh, so yeah, that's typically how I see it. And then when I say like, what's a series A, which is the after, um, that's when there's normally something there to look at, to play a prototype, early access build, can play it, maybe we've got some numbers even, uh, but maybe it just you know, needs dollars for marketing and, and, and global launch. Excellent, thank you. Look, we do have a couple of more questions. There is one here from uh, on a tweet from someone saying, hey, how does it work when you work in a related industry? Like I'm trying to move from one industry as a software developer to, a to the games industry. Is that viewed as good, bad, neither, neutral? Michael, maybe is that with you? Uh, I mean, if you kind of think of like the job market, it's, it's a little bit like that, right? You know, when you're, change, you're doing like a horizontal job shift, and you say, hey, I'm going to go from um, QA testing into game design. There'll be certain aspects that you'll be able to say, hey, look, I really understood I know, project management. And I spent a lot of time with playing different games for the last five years, playing test builds of every single AAA game out of uh, Ubisoft, right? Then, you know, so understanding what is that strength and skill set and kind of unique insight that you've developed. And then, how does that help you with your new role or job? Um, I think that that's probably going to be, that, that's going to be the argument that you're going to have to think about to yourself as well. So, you know, we've, we've, we've seen it happen. Um, and I've certainly kind of founded, uh, sorry, um, invested in founders who, who have that kind of background. But normally that individual or those individuals either are working with someone who may kind of make up some of those gaps or they have developed some really unique perspective on something that is just, you know, no one else has really thought about, right? And, and that, then it really doesn't matter what your background is. 
Yeah. But I don't know. Also, Scott, for example, yeah, you, you probably have a lot to add to this, given you hire a lot of people around the world. I was just about to say, maybe yeah. Scott and Tima can can also give their perspective, given that they are hiring. Yeah, I mean, if you've got an idea that you want to pitch to VCs straight away, this might not be relevant. But and I'm not saying this because we're hiring, but um, you know, potentially join a startup in the gaming space, like you know. Uh, Tima or you know something like us or or another one like there's, there's quite a few actually in the Australian and, and learn from their experience and what they've done and how they're growing and how they're going through you'll potentially gain a lot from that um and you know everyone is looking for talent here and we're trying to pull people out of other industries my I mean like my background is gaming but we're not building it you know we're not we don't create we don't ship games or software so we ship you know almost a web service so so like almost our entire team is not necessarily game oriented people um again it, it, it really what it comes down to is you lose probably one of the the key selling points to vcs which is unfortunate in that you can't if you are raising from vcs and that's your goal you can't really sell your history and your sort of i guess uh, experience in the industry and what you shipped previously because you don't have that foundation to to, to sort of highlight you just got to then focus on your other strengths and maybe your strengths might be that you've got a really unique idea and here's the path to it achieving scale. Maybe you have shipped really interesting things in a space that you're in and you think that you can apply some of the concepts you learned in gaming. Like, I guess I've probably talked about story the entire time, but for me, you have lost a key pillar of strength there, which is, Hey, look at this background body of work that I've got. Just focus on your strengths and what you're doing and why you think it can reach, um, sort of, you know, the moon, I suppose, because like we came from a similar place. Tima, I should get anything that. Um, yeah, uh, I think for me, it's like, there's a reason why you start a new company, right? Like there is like some kind of reason why you want to do it, right? And it comes from, it should have like, it's not like suddenly, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm gonna do like, I don't know, like space startup. Right, and I've been game developer all my life. Right, it's just like it, it, there is a reason. Like even if you're not in that industry specifically, there is a reason, the passion behind why you're starting. Because like doing a company is like probably one of the most difficult things you can do in, in your life. Because like it's highly risky, you know, highly uncertain. So this background that you have, the drive to do this company is probably, you know, enough at some point even for investors when they realize oh this is the right person who does it if you don't have it then don't switch industry because you just want to try to raise the money yeah but i actually do think i agree and, and i do think that actually scott's comment on if it's something that you're really passionate by actually it's not a it's, it's actually a pretty good idea to leave join a fast growing startup right get that experience because exactly if you're looking about the stages that you know Mattio and Ota are at there is fast growing stage where you know if you can if you if you can prove yourself and demonstrate that you really are passionate about a certain thing you get a lot of opportunities a lot faster than you would have got were you in a you know larger AAA company right and as a result i've seen plenty of profiles where they've said hey uh, i joined this early fast growing company i really went through the you know the the the, the pains and the growths through 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 that stage and now I'm leaving after taking all the learnings and the insights I've got to go do something else. And whilst it's painful for everyone, but you know, at least that individual um, has a, also a real insight into what it's like um, for working for a small, fast-growing company, right? And, and also, they're a lot more credible and get a lot more responsibility um, in the short, short term to medium term. Okay, thank you so much. Look, we have about a minute or so left. We have two more questions. Um, so let's have a look here. Um, so here on Zoom, someone's asking, what, what advice do you have for unproven games slash studios? Is there a combination of preparation, market research, a solid pitch deck, a games demo that all come together to lessen the risk in the eyes of an investor? Michael, maybe let's, do, let's start with you, given that, you know. Uh, no, I'll, I'll keep it brief easy. just to the time. Um, I, I, I think that often the proof is in the pudding. So if you're quote unquote like unproven, i.e. your CV, it's not, you know, the CV isn't as credible to what you're building in the future. The, the easiest way to demonstrate someone rather than trying to tell them or convince them is just to show them. So build something small, scrappy, get it out there in the world, get real people to use it, to play it. And that is often way more convincing than you know, anything else that you could talk about, right? Thank you so much. And we have one last question. 
and this could be a very entertaining one. Can you describe the best or worst pitch that you've seen to date and what makes them the best and worst? Michael, again, with 500 pitches. Um, no, no, go team yeah. first. Timo raises his hand. Uh, Timo raises, okay, all right. Okay, I'm talking no, 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 too much. No, no. Uh, I pitched once to like one of the like biggest investors in Silicon Valley and it didn't go well. So I was walking out of their office and uh, they had like a glass doors, which were like extremely like basically like see-through. So I was so like disappointed with my pitch that I walked straight into like into the glass wall and just knocked myself out. So yeah, and then they had to call the ambulance <laughs> to get me out of there. So <laughs> if you can beat that, <laughs> go ahead. That's a good story, that's a good story. <laughs> yeah, and it's like world famous investor as well. So. <laughs> No, that hasn't happened to me yet. So uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't top that. What's your last one? I've been pitched. I've been pitched at least three different cat metaverses. Tima, to your comment about pet MMRPG, three. It's probably trending, man. Wow! Did anyone did anyone pitch a dog metaverse? Oh, I think it's dogs and cats. I think, yeah. <laughs> but, okay. but, they're, well, they're, but they specialize sometimes they specialize yeah, yeah. i mean I, I don't want to really kill the pitch too like yeah, but but it's you know we joke about it but really we're in a world where um uh someone some you know some people even up you know saying hey I've, I've got nft chess game uh so you know petaverse yes exactly that's one that i've seen and that's a phrase i think someone's actually used as well so it's it's and uh, they can raise money as well in the big round. So, like, you know, <laughs> like it's they hard. actually raise money. Yes. One of these Petaverse companies actually raise money. So, you know, I, yeah, yeah who knows? I, I, I can't really say it's best or worst. It could be the best. There you go. The Petaverse is coming. Hey, look, Michael, Tima, Scott, thank you so much for your time. I've really, really enjoyed this. Um, Scott, Tima, I hope once you have billion dollar companies, I can still stay in your pool house. Um, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Um, and yeah, so um, next week we're back with another webinar on um, equity investment and acquisition in games. So hope to see you then. Thanks again, Tima, Scott, Michael. Good stuff.